So if I go through the, the lens types, now we'll look at all these individually as well, but I'll just start holding them up. So we start with, and I'll show you what the these lenses actually do as well. So I've got some sample images that I'll go through for all of these. But if we start with the ultra wide or the fisheye, I just need to get rid of the chat for a while so I can see what I'm showing you and make sure you can see it. So can you see that this lens is a bit round on the top? Now this lens that is a fisheye lens and they're, they're kind of fun for artistic things and special effects. They're also really handy if you're doing 360 photography because this is a, almost a full 180 degree view. So the half circle around you. I'll show you why that's good and bad in a moment. But if you're doing a 360, you do one shot that way and then one shot that way and blend them later on and you've got a full spear. So the pro of these lenses is that you can capture nearly anything and you can almost shoot round corners and you'll see why that's good and bad in a moment. The con is you get distortion and you get weird shapes in the images. The next one is a wide angle. Now this one, you'll be able to see the glass in there. I hope you can see it is really got pronounced curvature. So it's actually round. The, this lens is actually the same width as this one. So this one, seven millimeter to 12, I think. Yep, seven to 14, sorry. And this one, 7.5, it's fixed. But this one doesn't have the distortion that this one has. And you'll see that in the sample images shortly because it's got some really clever optics that fix it. Now it certainly does have distortion because anytime you put a lens this wide on, um, you're going to see some distortion in your images. And I'll show you what that means shortly. You probably get sick of me saying that, but what they're really good for is local guide stuff. They're good for buildings and architecture, real estate shots. And if you're out in a massive landscape, like those mountains that Vandana was in before, this sort of lens means you can capture more of it, but it does have a drawback, which I'll show you. So it's really good for big scenes, but you do have a lot of distortion and you exaggerate your linear perspective quite a bit. So uh, lines that are supposed to be nice and straight won't be with this kind of lens. You can certainly fix it. There's a lot of post-processing tools that are really, really good at fixing straight lines that aren't straight anymore, but that does change your image a little bit. Then we get into things like a standard prime. I can show you a couple of those. Oops, there goes the lens cap for that one. This one is a, a thingify lens, this one's actually special. It's a um, pinhole lens, which means it actually has no glass in it. If I can show you, you can, I don't know if you can see through it because it's such a tiny hole, but there's actually no glass in these ones. And they're, they're really cool for some fun effects. It's like taking your photography back to the 1800s. Sounds silly that you'd want something that wasn't sharp, but you get sick of sharp. Now, the standard prime, these are absolutely fantastic for things like portraits, wildlife, street, and in a local guides context, food. They're beautiful for food because you can do really cool images. They see a lot like your eye does. So your eye actually sees at about 35 millimeters. 35 millimeter on my camera, um, if I put a 35 lens on here, it's actually about 70. I'll talk about that in a future session of why that's different. But primes, because they see like your eye, are the easiest ones for you to work with because you're used to looking at things that way. You're used to seeing what the camera is going to show you. Whereas some of the other lenses can be a little bit confusing. Um, they do have a limited range in that you can't zoom these things. They're just that one, one single focal length. So if you want to bring something closer, you've got to walk towards it or change lenses. When you've got a zoom, which is, where's he like, ah, I'm a nuffy, it's on the camera. But if you've got a zoom, then you can change the lens so that it gets bigger, essentially. That's the simplest way to put it. Um, it just lengthens the lens and it brings things closer towards you when you do that. The zoom lens are really good for portraits, event photography, wildlife, uh, candid street photography. You can get closer without physically moving and you can change the frame, which makes it easier to compose. They can introduce some 
barrel and pincushion distortion where your images don't quite look right and you might get a little bit of curving in them or you might get some distortion around the edges. I personally find that's okay because I tend to put onto the thirds quadrants or I center the thing that I want to take a picture of. When you get into telephoto, these are the big ones. Uh, they're good for wildlife, sports. They bring far away things much, much closer. They do also have drawbacks. They are large and they are heavy and they are often slow. Now, slow is two things. When you're focusing over a long distance, some lenses take a really long time to do it. This one's pretty quick because it's in one of the professional ones. But if you've got consumer grade stuff, you might be waiting a while. And that can mean that maybe you miss the shot, which can be a little bit unhappy. Uh, now, the other one, there's actually two more I'm going to show you, one that's not on the list. But this last one is a macro. Now, I've included macro in this session because a lot of people asked about it from the last session. So macro lenses let you take photos of little teeny weeny things and make them really big. So it's a lot of fun. It's actually a challenging way to do photography. Uh, and we'll get into that because I'll show you some stuff later. Now, this one, you're going to think I'm breaking this. This one bends. So it's called a lens baby. This is a Composer 2, I think, from memory. No, it's a Composer Pro. Uh, it, it's not much different to the other ones. It's used for moving the center of the image. So everybody's used to having these wonderful sharp images. These are actually deliberately not sharp, but I'll show you what that does in just a moment. Just get back to my presentation. So you can see my range. And one thing you'll probably notice in this image is you can probably tell which ones of those lenses are newer than the other ones. And in the case of the macro, which one doesn't get used very much because macros are a very specific thing. That's what I was saying about the professional things is that they handle a lot of rough stuff. So I'm pretty awful to my camera equipment. And it's like any tool. If you're buying a screwdriver, if you go down to the supermarket and buy a screwdriver, it's going to break the second or third time you use it. If you go to a tool shop and you buy a good quality screwdriver, it will probably last you for the rest of your life and the rest of your kids' lives and possibly your grandkids' lives if you're lucky enough to have them. Now, I'm going to go through a series of shots. Now, what I did is I went outside. Fortunately, we're allowed out again. Yay! Not quite everywhere, but most places. Um, and I deliberately put up a tripod and I took all of these from the same viewpoint. So these, from a composition perspective, aren't going to be very nice because that's not what I was trying to show. I used F8 all the way through, so a fairly small hole to try and give a good depth of field all the way through the whole lot. And I show the widest and the narrowest for each of the lenses. Now, I've just noticed a few things popping up in the chat. So just before I go through those, I'll just have a quick look. Um, Jess mentioned that she used to have a wide lens on the previous phone. And yes, it is very, very helpful. And it does have some distortion a little bit, you're right. Um, and when I'm talking about lenses, it's actually a really good point. The phone lenses often work the same way as the ones I'm talking about. So the same things are coverable across those. Uh, Vandana mentioned that I have a lot of lenses. Um, this is nothing. <laughs> I have a lot more than this. I've been collecting for quite a long time and I've got a lot of old lenses from ranging back from the late 1800s up to fairly recent stuff about the 70s and 80s. And I've got my current gear. I've got a big gap between the 70s and 80s and the current gear though. Um, and it is, Ananda points out that it, it's great to borrow lenses from your friends. Um, I'm, and he says, but for self-preservation, watch that quote friend unquote that breaks your gear. So he and I both know someone who's quite famous for falling into the sea and falling into lakes and dropping things and sticking his finger in things where it doesn't belong. And yeah, we've both fallen victim to that particular individual. Well, I won't mention because it's a bit mean and he might watch the video and then he'd get me. So if we go and have a look through our lenses, the first one is the Samyang 
fisheye. This is a really fun little lens. And if you've never played with a fisheye, I encourage you to get your hands on one and have a bit of a go. If you've got a phone, its widest setting probably is a fish. It's good for fun stuff and artistic shots. But you'll notice that drawback. Remember I talked to you, it's almost a 180 degree shot. Up in the top right hand corner of that image, what can you see? That's my finger pressing the button. <laughs> I can't avoid putting that finger there. It has to be there to press the button, but it's actually in the shot, which is kind of tedious because it means I have to crop it out later. Uh, someone's just asked a question. I'm just waiting for the chat to refresh. Some I mean, Feliciana said Sam Yang reminds me of a Korean instant noodle. Yeah, it does kind of. <laughs> um, Rosie asked how many total lenses I have. It's actually about 70. And starting learning photography, which lens should you have? That's easy. Get one that suits what you want to do. Now, this lens, the 12 to 100, which I bought last year just before Connect, I got this one because it's a great range for traveling. So this, on a, on a full frame camera, this would be a 24 to 200, which is a, a really good range for everyone. There's not much you'd want to do outside of that range, generally speaking. So I have to say, having put this one on the camera in about October last year, it's not often I take it off especially this year because it couldn't go outside. The next one is that wide that I showed you. And you can certainly see some wear marks on this lens. It's been through hell. It's uh, been in waterfalls. It's been everywhere. It's a cool thing about having uh, waterproof stuff. Uh, someone did just talk about an 18 to 55 lens. That is actually a very common one. The so This is a 7 to 14 millimeter. It's 2.8, so it's nice and bright. It's really good for architecture, big landscapes, but you're not going to see a lot of detail, and that's its drawback. So when we look in the image, that same image we got before, it's almost the same frame that we had from the Samyo. It's really close. It's not distorted, because you'll notice that the line of that fence in the foreground is still fairly straight. There's a bit of weirdness going on in the corners. And if you look at the top right-hand corner where the sun is, and I have to say I framed it this way deliberately to highlight this, you get a bit of lens flare as you cross that image from right to left and from top to bottom. Lens flare is fun. It's great for when you're using it creatively, but if you're trying to do something and you don't want that flare, it can be really annoying and you might have to use something like a hat or a t-shirt or something to try and block the sun out of it. Now your foreground gets exaggerated. So the fence and those trees are actually much bigger than they really are. But your distant things are really distant. You can barely even see what's happening. And it's only a couple of hundred meters from us. When you go wide, or you bring it, zoom in a little bit, it gets a little bit better. So you're getting into the, the 14 millimeters. You've still got strong flare things happening. And in this one, I don't know if you can see it, but I can certainly see some distortion. I can see this horizon, for example, is actually curved, which for me is a little bit cringy because I like a flat horizon. It's the only thing in photography that I've never been able to get over. I've gotten over things not being sharp. I can be deliberately unsharp. I kind of actually like it. But a horizon for me has just got to be flat. We get into our standard primes. They come in lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of sizes, loads of them. Um, Alphys just asked a question about mirrorless adapters, so let me deal with that when the chat refreshes. Sorry about the pauses, but the chat keeps disappearing. Uh, what do I think about mirrorless lenses adapter to get the same image quality connected to any of your lens family? That's actually a, a fairly interesting question when you're using adapters. If you're using a really good adapter, like a Metabones, and you can feel free to Google Metabones, M-E-T-A-B-O-N-E-S. You can run almost any lens on almost any camera if you buy the right set of adapters. And they're almost as good and almost as fast as they are native. So the Sony, for example, does that Stuart's got, can run Canon lenses. 
and it does a really nice job of it. And the fast autofocus on those lenses actually works pretty well with a Metabones adapter. But if you use a cheap adapter that's just adapting the format, and perhaps not the electronics, or it's adapting the electronics in a poor way, you'll have a bad experience. Now, if you're trying to build up your lens collection and you've changed camera platforms. So some years ago, I changed from the Canon platform to the Olympus platform. It took some of my friends, uh, Ananda's one of them, it's here tonight, probably four or five years to convince me that it was worth doing. And it's a big choice to make. It's a really big choice. If you move not only brand, but format, so the connector that the lens uses and the size of the sensor, it's quite a big change to your photography because you might have built up quite a good collection. So in the gear that I had before, um, I shouldn't say this too loud because my wife will hear it, I had about $20,000 worth of lenses. I've probably spent 10, maybe 12, going into the new platform. And that's a big deal. But the advantage is my old lenses held their value. That's another cool thing about professional glasses. It holds its value. It tends not to get cheaper. And I was able to buy all of the new gear by selling all my old gear. But it takes a long time to do that, and it takes a long time to build your collection up again. So an adapter can be a good interim measure, but I think you'll be unhappy if you use it forever. Uh, we just had a, can I recommend a cheap mirrorless camera? Um, I could, but I won't. What I'll do, and I, I'm not trying to be mean, I'm not trying to be um, arrogant or anything like that. What I prefer people to do is to go to a camera store, and you can't do this online, so please go to a real store, support a real store, because they do a lot of work to look after us, um, and try different cameras, try different platforms, try different lenses, and see what suits you, see what you like, because everybody's gonna need differences. If you're traveling, like Bandana took those amazing shots in the Himalayas, probably carrying all of her worldly possessions in a pack on her back, you don't want to carry 20 kilograms with the camera equipment. You're going to take a, a small portable camera that suits that job. Likewise, if you're like me and you go for a three hour hike to go and find a waterfall that someone told you about and you can't find it on maps, but you can kind of see a depression in the landscape where it might be, and you're going to find a track and bush bash your way in there, you don't want a really heavy camera. So my camera with this lens on it weighs a about 1.2 kilos, which is a lot if you're hiking. It's an awful lot. I mean, people who um, hike, let, let's call it professionally if you like, um, I've done it, you'll go to the extent of cutting the end off your toothbrush and just taking the head. You'll cut down your knife and fork to make them shorter to get rid of some weight because you've got to carry that crap all day, every day on your back and it's just wearing. So the less you've got, the better. So we'll get back into our primes, have a look at what it does for you. What the prime gives you usually, and this is the same for nearly every prime lens from nearly every manufacturer, is it gives you a flat, clear, sharp image. Normally there's very little distortion in a prime because they don't have to have the conflicting needs of engineering something that can move. So they're much, that's why primes are much cheaper as well. And you can get really good primes for quite a little bit cheaper. Um, Akshat's asked, is there a difference in quality between mirrorless and DSLR? Um, no, not really. Particularly if you're publishing images for the web. If you are printing a billboard, you probably want a DSLR or a medium format in a full frame. If you're doing anything else, you probably don't need that much resolution. I know people go out of their way and do something like buy a 50 megapixel camera. You just really don't need it. Stuart looks like he wants to disagree with me. <laughs> um, when you get into zooms, as I said before, this one's a, an awesome traveling lens. And if you can take one lens traveling, even if you're not hiking, just because you're walking around all day, like last year, I was lucky enough to go to Connect, wonderful experience. And before that, I went to New York probably walked, I don't know, 40, 50 kilometers around New York. And carrying one lens is much better than carrying five. 
So the zoom with this one, it's a nice clean lens, which is something I look for. The distance is a little bit compressed, so you, you, you sort of feel like things are a little bit closer than they really are in the image. There's a slight curve to the horizon on this one because they do have the challenges of going from what is essentially almost an ultra wide up to a telephoto. Uh, Isha asks, can 360 photographs be taken with a mobile phone camera? They certainly can, but it's a very interesting thing to do. You end up taking about 250 shots and you look a little bit like a ballerina. There's some good articles on um, the Street View Trusted Professional site for how to do it. And if you download the Street View app from Google onto your phone, whether it's Android or iPhone, they both support it. Um, it will actually walk you through what you need to do. And you'll certainly get what I mean once it's walked you through, because it actually pops little blue dots on the screen and you have to move around to cover each of the blue dots in your sphere. With the zoom, when you zoom out, it brings things closer to you. So you see, we can see this construction equipment at the end of this pier. It's a horrible dim, dark day, so please excuse the quality of the image. I don't like it. It's a bit noisy, but it'll do for this particular thing. But you can start to see some of the detail of the machinery that's down there. You can certainly see all of the shapes and you can even get quite a good resolution rendition of people on the pier. At this level of zoom, it's got quite a nice level of horizon. But if I go back to the previous one, you'll notice the horizon was slightly curved. So when it's at 12 millimeters, it does have this curve. But when it's zoomed out the other way, it doesn't. It's OK as long as you're used to it. The telephoto one, so this one is a 40 to 150, which barely qualifies as a telephoto, really, because normally they're much bigger than this. And I've got a, a teleconverter on this one, which is like a lens for a lens. So it goes onto the back and it magnifies the lens. So it just gives it a bit more range. Very useful for sports and wildlife. I find I don't use this one much because even though it's only half the weight of the lenses from the body system I came from, it's still bloody heavy. So I don't use it much at all. It's probably a waste of money to be honest with you. Uh, it gives you a nice flat horizon. It's sharp right through. It gives you enough detail for memory. So essentially where this lens leaves off is about where this one starts. But you can zoom right in and you can get some really interesting details. So if it wasn't such a horrible dark day, I could have done better here. You, you can just barely see the mesh on those windows. Um, you can certainly see cable on the winching drums and on the crane, which you couldn't see with the other lenses. On a nice bright day, um, you'd be able to see the faces of the people on that pier from 250 odd meters away. And it lets you get right in on things and, and fill your frame, which is something I like doing. And we get onto the, the lens baby, the bendy lens. It's an artistic lens. It's nothing else for it. It's just for artistic things, for playing around. It's for having fun, essentially. And I use it quite a bit in street photography because in street photography, you're trying to highlight something interesting that's going on. But in a crowded street scene where there's a lot of movement and a lot of color, it can be hard to direct people to that interesting thing. So in this particular place, you can see the um, guy with all of his studs and his mohawk and things. He's quite clearly looking at the woman that's walking away from him. I've no idea why, but he was quite fixated on her. There's nothing particularly out of the ordinary about it or nothing that I would think would attract your attention. But because I've used the lens baby, it takes away all of that distraction and just lets you see the thing that you want to see. The downside is even in its sharp point, it isn't sharp. And Ender's asking me if I've shown the people who think the earth is flat. Yeah, they're kind of funny. <laughs> And the last one I'm going to show you tonight is the macro lens. So a lot of people asked about this, the little macro fella. It's quite a lot of fun. And I went out and I shot some shots today for this. And I, I, I have to admit, I'd kind of forgotten how much fun macro is. So it's not a lot of use for local guides, but it's awesome for documenting your surroundings and turning your surroundings into art. And I'll show you what I mean. So you can get some amazing detail. This is actually shot with the Canon 105 macro, which will work on a Sony Stuart. <laughs> it's a 
beautiful lens. It's probably one of the best lenses I've ever owned. I don't own it anymore. I believe it actually financed that one. <laughs> but you'll see things that you've never seen before. So you've probably all seen baby mosquitoes wriggling around in, a, in some water somewhere. But have you ever seen that they've got little hairs coming out of them? It's just cool, some of the things you can pick up. Amazing all the other things that were in this drop of water that I just sucked up from a pond too and put onto a, a little black piece of glass. All these other bits and pieces are in there that you just don't see. So it opens up a new world to you. So you find things that you didn't really know were there. So in this shot, I was outside. It's not the nicest rose in the world. It's a bit chewed because I've got an aphid problem in my garden. It's a nice rose, but when you get in a bit closer, you notice something. There's a, a hair or something in there, and there's some little things. And you go in a bit closer again, and this is about as far as you can get with this macro lens. They're baby aphids. So they, they're the next generation of what's eating my roses. So again, a new world. And who knows where the hair came from? Probably here. And the reason I say you can use it for art, this is a tomato from my garden. Something decided it wanted it more than I did, so it had it. But there's so much texture and colour and shape when you get in really close to a little tomato that it's really, really cool. Um, Akshat asked what aperture macro lenses have. Um, this one ranges from 3.5 right up to, I think it's 32 actually, for this one, from memory. But um, actually it's 2.8, I just noticed. So it's varying with all of the, the macro lenses. And I just, just put, pick up one thing that you said, um, Akshat, um, you asked about a micro lens. A micro is different again, micro smaller again. Micro is for microscopes. You can take pictures through a microscope, but it's bloody hard. It's very hard to find the focus and get a good depth of field from a macro lens. From a microscope, it's almost impossible. That's why they sandwich stuff between bits of glass. Now, where the macro most comes in, and this is why I say it's so much fun, is it lets you start to generate, generate's the wrong word. It lets you unleash some of your art. And the shapes and colors and textures that you can find just in your garden are really amazing. The things that are on this earth are amazing. Probably a lot better off without us, but that's a different story. So this is just a simple daisy with some water drops on it from some rain this morning. But it's, it's just absolutely beautiful. This is a little jade plant and you get some really cool compositions and you, you do get a very shallow depth of field, which we'll cover properly in a future session. But you'll notice in this one, anybody that knows jade plants or some of the other names they're known by, the leaf is only about two millimeters thick, tiny things. And that leaf that's immediately behind it is out of focus. So that certainly gives you some idea. And Ananda's just made a point there. Do you want to unmute and talk about that, Ananda? Yep, I'm un unmuted. Um, yeah, uh, macro lens uh, may have a bright aperture of uh, 2.8 or 3.5. Uh, they don't normally come uh, brighter than that. Um, and that's to help you have enough light uh, to focus and to let the autofocus system in the camera help you focus. Um, but that's not what you should add um, because to get enough depth of field, even if you do uh, amazing special techniques like focus stacking, um, you're going to shoot at f8, f11, f16. Um, you're always going to shoot at a very small, dark aperture. Um, otherwise, you won't get enough depth of field. Over to you, Paul. Thanks, Ananda. Um, this image actually is focus stacked. It's. I'll, I'll talk about that technique very briefly. Um, the, I'm lucky enough that my camera platform does can do focus stacking by itself. It's one of its really cool features. <laughs> Ned is laughing his ass off. Um, this is eight shots, and 
I set a focus point, hit the button, the camera takes eight shots, moving the lens slightly each time, and then it blends them all together using what it perceives as the sharpest parts of each of those images and creates the final result. And you do get a little bit more depth of field. It's not a lot. If you want a lot more depth of field from macro photography, you're going to need to do manual focus stacking. I'm not going to go into that topic because it's frankly bloody difficult. <laughs> There's some really good software out there that helps you, but even that's really difficult to drive, I find. Uh, other people have great success with it. Um, Akshat wants to talk about ISO and shutter speed. We're talking about ISO next week. I think we're talking about shutter speed next week too, and some more about aperture. It's a big topic, aperture. The other kind of thing you can do with macro, and this is a, a little bit of the artistic side of things, is because of the way it works, you can sort of see through things, sort of. And any lens can do this really, but you might not notice it in your other photos because you tend not to be close to things. In this one, there's actually several leaves above the one I shot with the water drops on it. But I'm shooting through the gaps. Because the things that are outside of my depth of field are so out of focus, you kind of can't see that they're there. You just see some dreamy coloration where those where those are it's just kind of cool i like it you get to see interesting things so is it a rugged landscape or is it some food and if it is food what is it i can tell you what this is it's um greek pit pitta made with feta and uh, my mother-in-law made that this morning <laughs> it's a little bit too much detail for a maps food photograph, just a little bit, but it's still a lot of fun. So we're getting into the last part of this session tonight, and then we'll open up for questions. And I'm about to talk to you about your tasks for this week. There's actually two, but you can combine them. The first thing I want to talk to you about is leading lines. Now, one of Vandana's shots that we saw earlier tonight, which was a wooden boardwalk, Going into, uh, Iwede just says, why does she feel like I fell in love with macro? Yeah, I do. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. It's really cool. I love it. Um, but leading lines can take your eye on a journey. And it's one of the tricks in photography to get you to look where the photographer wants you to look. So if you want someone to look at a particular place, try and get yourself somewhere in that composition where things lead away from you towards that place because people's eyes tend to naturally follow lines. They tend to naturally follow funnels because it's just how we see stuff. So in this particular case, this is on the New York High Line, which is a, it's, can't really call it an abandoned railway anymore. It's more of an arts precinct these days, but it used to be an abandoned railway. You can just see some railway track down on the right-hand side there. Um, these lines of the concrete path are leading you down into the art structure, which I'm pretty sure was called doorways from memory. It's very creative. It's the same kind of name I probably would have given it because, you know, I've got that sort of imagination. And it's leading you towards the people that are walking away from you, but they're also going on a journey. So the lines are taking you into the artwork, taking you to the people, and the people are going in the same direction as the lines. So for me, this is what I like to see in a composition. You don't have to do it, and I often don't do it, but it just makes an image to me easier to look at because you know where, where you want to go and you know what the photographer wanted you to look at, especially in this one, which is surrounded by so much chaos of all of those leaves. This is a, um, oh, what's the word? It's a typical is not the right word. <laughs> I've lost the word I was looking for. I should have put it in the presentation. But anyway, th this is a very, very typical New York image that you see a lot. You see it a lot in their TV shows. You see it a lot in um, the arts or, that people tend to take from New York because you've got all these taxis. You've got all this wonderful red brick architecture that the, the city is famous for. Again, leading lines takes you off into the nice misty distance and it takes you on a bit of a journey through a very crowded, very heavy traffic afternoon 
which is about bog standard for New York, by the way, except at the moment, I saw an image shot from this place only this morning and I was trying to get hold of the person to get permission to show it to you, but I haven't been able to reach them. I wish I could because it's the exact same scene, but it's completely empty. There's no one there, no cars, no people, nothing. And to me, I loved it. I actually wish I was in that city right now, apart from the fact I'd probably die while I was there. So the leading lines in this one tame all of that chaos. So there's all of the windows, there's the lights, traffic lights, car headlights, people with umbrellas, trees, there's all these things trying to get your attention. But the leading lines going in underneath the bridge and going up that road just draw you on that journey. It's hard to resist that journey. I keep using the word journey, but I do kind of like it. <laughs> 